Uh, welcome. Welcome everybody to, um, to this uh, webinar about the report on Danish businesses and the biodiversity uh, crisis. Um, uh, welcome a lot uh, for coming. I think we will wait just uh, 20 seconds or something to, uh, to get the, the last uh, people on board. Almost 200 people uh, have signed up for the webinar today. Yes, so as uh, mentioned, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bo, I'm the Secretary General of WWF in Denmark, and with me today is also uh, Torsten. Torsten, uh, a word from you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name, as uh, Bo just mentioned, is Torsten Witt. I am a partner and the responsible for what we call social impact in, uh, in the Nordics in uh, in Bain and Company, which is a, a global uh, consulting firm. So uh, the webinar today is based uh, on two, actually two reports that was published just around the summer holidays uh, about the Danish businesses and Danish industries and the biodiversity uh, crisis. Uh, these are hefty documents, uh, well over 150 uh, pages in very great detail. So what we would like to do today in this presentation is to give you an overview of what's in the report and what is the status actually right now. And then uh, if you download the reports at uh, our or Bain's uh, website, you can go into great detail on your industry and the uh, specific uh, challenges that you may face in, in the future. Uh, also, I would like to say that uh, we are recording this uh, webinar uh, so that you can have a chance to, uh, to uh, get back to it and look at it uh, at a later stage and also for all of those who did not have the opportunity to uh, attend today. And finally, feel free to, uh, to ask some questions in, in the uh, chat section. I, I must say, though, that uh, we, uh, we expect that uh, the presentation will be almost an hour long, so hopefully a little time in the end. If not, uh, feel free to contact us directly. And I can also tell you that we are working on a conference later in the year uh, where we will look further into the future, how we can help each other work with these uh, issues. So um, the agenda today is that uh, I will start off by uh, talking a little bit about Denmark and the biodiversity crisis. Uh, we will then go through the status on the Danish businesses and, and, and so on. During the research, we also found some roadblocks why a lot of companies have uh, difficulties uh, starting up uh, working with biodiversity. So we're going to look what are the roadblocks and what can we do to, uh, to overcome these. And then at the end, a lot of good advice on, on how to, uh, to work with, with this. Uh, and finally, as the fifth point, we'll give you a brief introduction to all the legislation and all the areas that are coming into effect in the coming months. A lot of legislation underway, which will, will influence most of your businesses. But uh, let's uh, start off by the status on biodiversity and Denmark and where we are. So um, basically, when it comes to biodiversity, which is the richness of life, it's all the plants and the animals and the ecosystems and the genetic material in the, in the natural or the living uh, world. And basically, the, the hardcore basic problem or challenge for us and the rest of the world is that nature is disappearing at an alarmingly high rate. We are burning the forest, we are taking away uh, wild nature and use it for man's uh, purposes. Uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, uh, the United Nations uh, made, a, uh, made a biodiversity panel. So just like the climate panel, there is now a biodiversity planet, pa panel. And they made a report, the one you can see to the top right hand, a report on the status of the natural uh, world. And it's a pretty grim uh, reading. Uh, it says that a, a million uh, species are at the brink of extinction, that we expect that 25% of all species are uh, uh, threatened by extinctions, and that the world's ecosystem have declined 47%. Uh, at, at the end of the report, also a couple of pages talking about higher raw material prices, water shortages, extreme heat, uh, lack of food production in, in many areas. So it's grim reading. 750 uh, researchers, I think 758 
And perhaps also nice for you guys to know, not a single one disagree with the content. So it's not like the climate the reports where there were some disagreements. Here, all of the researchers agree with each other. We have a challenge. Uh, if you look into uh, animal species and their decline, uh, actually WWF have been looking at these. We've calculated 22,500 different populations of animals since the 1970s, 1971. There is an average decline on 60% of number of individuals. So a hefty decline in individual species. So it's not just species disappearing, it's also individuals, animals that disappear from our planet. If you have a decline at that many species at that high level, that is what the, technically it lives up to the standards, what the scientists call a mass extinction event. So this uh, means that uh, we are now in a mass extinction uh, period. The last time we had a mass extinction in, in, on earth was 65 million years ago when the, uh, when the dinosaurs disappeared. Uh, so this is uh, pretty, pretty hefty uh, stuff. And it's all induced by humans. There are no other uh, outside explanation for this. Um, if you look into Danish nature, and I have to uh, remind you all that most of your businesses both influence international nature and Danish nature. I will get back into that in a second. But if you look into Danish nature, we are also in a pretty tough uh, place. This is an overview of the status of the quality of nature in the different EU countries. And as you can see, Denmark is second to last. Uh, almost all of our nature is in a poor condition or extremely poor condition, which is uh, uh, the red and the yellow areas you see here. So what's happening? Basically what's happening is that we take away uh, nature and we turn it into cities or agriculture or uh, other types of, uh, of human-induced uh, work. Here you can see a heat map where it's uh, going on. As you can see in Europe, uh, it's really, really uh, serious and in central uh, US. And you can also see that the Denmark is a, a highly red uh, area. 62% of all our land is now agriculture. Less than 2% is original nature around 8% of Danish landmass is what you could call nature, even if it's a forest that we have planted ourselves. Actually, if you look into the Ibis report, the one from the United Nations, it says that 75% of, of the Earth's ice-free land surface has been altered by, by humans. Uh, so so uh, it is a, a huge uh, impact uh, that we have on Earth. Uh, when we talk about alterations, we normally talk about uh, turning uh, nature into agriculture or urban, but we also influence uh, nature in other ways. And one of the things that I would like to highlight, which is also part of the report, is that a lot of companies are not aware that when they, for example, build new factories or new facilities, they lose, lose a lot of sand. And if you look here from the Stockholm Resilience Center that look over the raw materials of, of the world, sand is now a huge crisis. We simply miss sand. This also goes in, in Denmark, where we're taking up a lot of sand from the, from the bottom of the ocean and used for building materials over time. This is, uh, uh, you could say, uh, diagram of how we use nature in Denmark. As I mentioned uh, before, uh, most of it is now agriculture, around 62%, and we have around 8% forest, uh, but it's only 1% to 2%, which is original pristine forest, something that looks like forest should be uh, way back in the Viking or Middle Ages. But I would also like to highlight another thing. That's the uh, pink box at the top right-hand corner, and that is that Besides the, uh, the footprint we have in our own country, we have a huge footprint around the world. So we take, we buy soil from South America, we buy palm oil from Southeast Asia, uh, we, we import a lot of materials that put a huge footprint on nature around the world. And soil and palm oil are among the most important. 
As you can see from this uh, map, if you have the white areas, that's where you originally had soybean production in 2002. And the red areas are where you have soybean productions in 2018. So you can see a pretty hefty expansion of, uh, of uh, soy production. And we import a lot of soy uh, to Denmark. I know that most of you are thinking, yeah, but that's a uh, feed for pigs. But we also use soy in a lot of other um, uh, products, probably also in, in many of your, uh, of your uh, industries. So it's not just uh, for feed or food. As you can see here, most of the soil is not certified uh, sustainable. So uh, these reports from the University of Copenhagen says that the soy and, and palm oil, it's really tough on the climate because you burn forest to get these fields. And also 71% of the imported soil is not sustainable. Uh, and I can tell you that it's actually one company that uh, buys most of the sustainable soil. So if you are not dealing with Ala, then uh, most of it is uh, unsustainable. Then there's palm oil. Uh, and uh, the reason that palm oil is interesting is that palm oil is used in a lot of different uh, products. Here you can see uh, food and you can see uh, uh, cosmetics and so on, but it's also used in, in, in some types of paper production, a lot of other uh, areas where, where the oil is very rich and, and, and really good for, uh, for a lot of things. So not just food and, and, and other stuff. Uh, another question which is important, as we can see from the report to ask your suppliers, do you use soy? Do you use palm oil? Is it certified? Is it uh, sustainable? Where do you get it uh, from? Does it have rainforest? Uh, on its conscience. One thing that you also need to be aware of is that a lot of these uh, products, which are agricultural products, are used for, for example, heating. They are also used in uh, biodiesel for cars and trucks. Uh, at the current level in the EU, around 25% of all diesel, even if you buy it at a normal petrol station, is uh, palm oil. So uh, it's food technically that you're, you're burning. And if your suppliers tell you it's uh, sustainable, uh, probably what they mean is that it has biofuel uh, in it, which could, which is probably uh, palm oil. A few other highlights on the status of the, of the living world. We have uh, the oceans I mentioned before that, uh, that uh, sand extraction is a huge challenge. Of course, uh, food uh, and feed is also a challenge here. 90% of all global fish stocks are either overfished or, at, or exploited uh, to the limit. Actually, 25% uh, of, of all the major fish stock that we live off is now in decline. Uh, and that also goes for Denmark. Uh, so this is not a, just a global uh, problem. Just a couple of months ago, the Danish government announced that uh, in the future, even if you're just a sports fisherman, you can only fish one cod per man per day in, in the Baltic Ocean. There's simply no uh, fish left. A little bit about water. We talk a lot about water these days, and that's climate related because the heat uh, dries out the wills. Uh, but there is a very, very, very hard, tough link between uh, uh, the degradation of nature and, and water. And I think it's important for all of you to know, if you cut down the forest, the forest, they create water, they uh, um, uh, take uh, uh, the clouds to them, they, uh, they have a, a part of the natural system. When it rains, they suck up the rain and very slowly uh, leads the water into the surrounding uh, uh, environment. So if you cut down nature, then you will have less water. And when the water comes, it will rain hard and you will have flash, flash floods and, and mudslides and, and so on. This is a huge uh, challenge. Many places uh, in the world will become even more so uh, in, in the future. Actually, the latest report from the, from the UN says that they expect 175 million uh, refugees or internally displaced people because of water in 2040. Uh, and to compare, today we have 71 million uh, refugees in total around the world from all causes. So uh, water is a big challenge. Good uh, for you guys to know is that you can also use nature to reverse this. 
We have projects around the world where you actually put back forest, you grow new forest, and then these natural water systems can start working again. So you don't have to dig deeper for water or have to move your factories. People say, yeah, but we have a lot of water in Denmark, but that's not entirely true. Uh, there are areas around the world, especially the industrial areas, for example, here in Kalumborg, where there is a lack of water. Uh, a lot of the water in Kalumborg comes from uh, huge uh, lakes, uh, and they see a decline in water level. So, uh, so water issues also in Denmark. The last uh, thing I, I would like to show you, you guys is how we pollute the natural uh, world. So uh, one of the main polluters we have is, is, is nitrogen and phosphorus, which is used for many different things, most importantly as fertilizer, fertilizers. And when this stuff gets into the environment and the heat is high, uh, then you have uh, ox oxygen uh, deprival or ill as we call it in, in Danish. It looks something like this if it's in a lake. Uh, this is a map, uh, it's from uh, NASA, that shows where you have the highest level of oxy oxygen depletion around the world. They call it the death zones. And as you can see, uh, Denmark is the epicenter of, uh, of, uh, of the oxygen depletion. Uh, if you go into the Baltic Sea, there is an area, or Östersøen, there is an area, uh, the size of the landmass of Denmark, so 42,000 square kilometers, which is completely dead because of oxygen depletion. On, on another level, of course, is uh, hormones and chemical substances, uh, phosphorus uh, substances, uh, short and long. Right now we have peak fos and peak fast. We discuss a lot about that, uh, but there are a number of other issues. And these uh, uh, chemicals are in a lot of different products. Uh, and you have to ask your suppliers, do you know what's in it? So for example, PFAS and PFAS, extremely common in, in surfaces on frying pans uh, and other um, uh, metals, which has been treated to withstand high heat. And we see these metals also in, in fabrication and, and, and factories around the world, if you have the production that includes uh, high heat. And then finally, uh, we've dis discuss been discussing this for years, but there's plastic, of course. I know a lot of Danish companies have come really far on plastics. Uh, that's not the case if you go uh, to the rest of, uh, of the world. Uh, this image is from India, but you can more or less go to uh, any major city in Southeast Asia or Africa, and you will see scenes like uh, this, uh, products uh, and product uh, packaging uh, with plastic just uh, left uh, in, in the open environment. Uh, I, I know a lot of thinking, okay, it doesn't look very nice, but is it really a problem for nature? And, and, and the problem is, it is. If these uh, plastic products, for example, touch coral, which is rather coral reefs, which is rather normal, the corals will die. Uh, they can't withstand the, some of the chemicals that are in the, uh, the plastic, and the plastic also ends up inside the animals and kills them. So, um, this is the status, the living world is, uh, is declining. And, uh, and if you look into these, uh, these uh, graphs, you can see a rather distinct uh, correlation. So uh, the more money we make, the more, the, the more resources we extract from the world, and the more money we make from these resources, uh, the more species are going extinct. So uh, this is actually the core of it. We need to be sure that we that is sustainable. We need to make make sure that the that the resources we extract are in uh, it does not influence the natural world. And we need systems which are circular, so we reuse uh, the resources instead of just taking out new resources all of the time. And I know a lot of you are working with this already in a number of other areas, for example, within climate or, 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 or so. And now, uh, as the report shows, Danish, Denmark is extremely exposed to this uh, area because we have high production, we have a high standard of, of living, we have a huge footprint around the world on the different products that I mentioned before. So uh, for us, uh, we have a special obligation to deal with this. Uh, but there's also a huge, I will show you in a second, a huge opportunity uh, to, uh, to actually make money out of this because uh, there is a business case uh, for doing it. If you look at the, um, 
at the uh, uh, extraction of the uh, of the um, of the materials or resources out of the world. So simply, how, how much do we actually consume? Uh, we have the Global Footprint Network research. Uh, I'm confident that a lot of you have, have heard of this. Basically, what they do is to say, how much biological material does the world produce in one year? And how much do we take out? And at the current level, if you look at a planetary scale, uh, we are spending, uh, we are consuming uh, enough materials, so we should actually have 1.7 Earth at our disposal if we should be in a balance. If uh, every citizen uh, should um, live like we live in Denmark, we should have 4.2 planets at our disposal. So uh, we are uh, simply using more money than we earn every year, uh, and we are taking a huge deposit in the bank account, and at some point we will run out. So uh, is, this, is this really a problem uh, financially? So one thing is that the planet is in decline. And uh, we actually have the World Economic Forum to look at this. They uh, make their global risk report every year. Uh, it looks something like this. Uh, I will show you in, in a little more detail in a second, so you don't have to look all the small print. But uh, this is just to say, if you have on the x-axis, how likely is it that an event will happen? And if you look at the y-axis, what would the impact on the economy be? So if you're in the top right-hand corner, then it's very likely to happen, and it will be very expensive for the business communities around the world. And if you look uh, at all the dots in the right-hand corner, they look like this. So you can see here uh, biodiversity loss, climate action, lack of water, and all of the problems that come out of this. So uh, pollution, extreme weather, natural disasters, lack of food, infectious diseases, and so on, closely linked to the decline in the natural world. Out of, not, out of the 10 most likely and most problematic areas, only two are not related uh, to, to nature, and that's uh, weapons of mass destruction and cyber attacks. So this is the future that we're looking uh, into. And uh, as I will show you in, at the end of this presentation, legislators know this and they also know the impact of this. So a lot of new legislation uh, coming. And also we expect that both the average consumer, your normal daily consumer and your uh, business partners will be aware of this and have to do something about it. Actually, uh, the report says that half of the world's GDP comes from nature. It's a stacking, it's an unbelievably uh, high uh, number, uh, incredibly high number. So half of world's uh, GDP somehow related to, uh, to nature. And this is the World Economic Forum. It's not WWF. It's the guys that takes care of, uh, of money. So what will happen? What does the, w, uh, what does the uh, World Economic Forum reports uh, say? So, so most importantly, what they believe will happen is on short term, increasing raw material prices. I'm, I'm showing you two examples here, vanilla, the price of vanilla now uh, the same as the price of silver. So a kilo of vanilla costs the same as a kilo of silver. Coffee, but we also see it on sand. We see it on different kinds of extractions. Uh, and now with the war in Ukraine, also fertilizer, for example. And this, these raw material uh, increases will, uh, will continue. Another good example is uh, all the, the good we come out of nature. Uh, I think the most popular example is, uh, is uh, pollination. We've seen a steep decline, 85% decline in Northern uh, Europe in the number of flying insects. Uh, and here you can see that uh, we are really dependent on these as, uh, as pollinators. Uh, and uh, it also, it's a lot of money we are talking about. So no flying insects, the in a huge increase in uh, raw materials. And just to give you an idea what will happen if, if uh, flying insects decline to a higher level, I uh, wanted to show you a few pictures. This is a picture from the US. It's a bee truck. They have so few flying, wild flying insects in parts of the US now that to pollinate their produce, they have, to, um, they have to move bees with trucks from field to field to make sure they're pollinated. It can't be done by the natural world. 
This is uh, what it looks like if you go to China. There they can't afford the trucks. So what this woman is doing is she's simply pollinating. This is pears, so pear trees. She's pollinating the pear trees by hand. If you go to agri agricultural um, uh, shows, you can now see uh, trucks with, with huge blow blasters that blow that pollinate uh, by heavy winds uh, generated by men. So, so this is an actual problem. It's not just a theoretical problem. And finally, before we go to the Danish industry and, and, and the report and, and Torsten will take over, I would just tell you that one thing is that this will influence uh, your consumers and your partners and they will have requirements and it will also influence the price of raw materials. Uh, but this also have another financial side. So Citigroup, the big, huge American bank, made a report a couple of, uh, yeah, about a year ago where they are saying that in the future interest rates for businesses which are in high extractive areas or in areas, geographical areas in the world where there's a huge biodiversity loss will have to pay higher interest rates. So this will influence your uh, access to, uh, to finance and, uh, and uh, capital. There's also a report out for, from Swiss Re, which is an insurance company. Uh, they actually have, you can go on the website, you can, you can simply put in the website, where is uh, my factory uh, or my, uh, where do I source materials uh, from? Uh, and uh, and uh, there you can see if, uh, if this area is at risk. Uh, interestingly or frighteningly, uh, what they're saying is that about a fifth of all countries worldwide are at risk of simply having an ecosystem collapse. So it's not just a decline in the natural world, it's a collapse. And this will influence uh, insurance areas. They actually have um, areas where you cannot get an insurance anymore. So I know this is, a, this is bad news. That's why you're all here and we need to discuss this, but I want to just say there are also some good news if you look into the reports from the UN and, uh, and from the World Economic Forum. Because what they say is that if we invest in nature, if we um, make more forest, if we invest in nature, just like you guys would invest in your supply chain or your employees or your business models, uh, then we can reverse this. And not even can we reverse this. Uh, what they're also saying is that um, there's actually a business case. So this report from the World Economic Forum looked at four different industries, all of which are major in Denmark. So one is transportation and one is agriculture. Uh, so, so huge, huge industries that if we invest uh, in, in, in nature and we try to get nature back, and if we go into what they call a nature positive scenario, this will generate $10 trillion of annual business value, or the GDP will be 10 trillion higher, and it will create 395 million jobs uh, by 2030. So there is a positive business case. If you look into uh, the Danish uh, part, it's 43 billion Danish, so 3 million more in, in, uh, in, in GDP uh, or, or business uh, value. So there's money to be had if, you're the, if, you, if we invest in, uh, in nature. So uh, yeah, a brief depressing uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and Torsten, uh, over, over to you on, uh, on the report and Danish businesses. Yes, thank you, uh, Bo. Um even though that I've heard this uh, presentation from you quite a few times now, it uh, yeah, it never ceases to to startle and alarm, and uh, uh, that's why uh, I'm happy to see so many uh, on this webinar. And once again, thanks for for joining. On when we wrote the report uh, on Danish businesses and the biodiversity crisis, we uh, we surveyed 75 of the of the biggest companies in Denmark on um, on the topic, and we uh, had in-depth interviews with twenty-five of them. Um, and if uh, you are representatives of uh, of those companies, I want to thank you once again for uh, for participating and allowing us to uh, to pick your brains on um, on how you see uh, what role. Um, you can play and we can play. 
Um, after Paul's uh, press or the Paul's uh, introduction here, we it's no it's no surprise that the main drivers of biodiversity loss is uh, the way we use land and sea, uh, the over exploitation of, uh, of organisms, the pollution that we uh, unfortunately uh, have allowed to uh, to get out of control. Uh, the climate change that we're that we've all been discussing for the last 20 30 years and uh, and also uh, uh, perhaps surprisingly uh, invasive species and diseases diseases not surprising but invasive species is uh, is a ma is a major part of this not in denmark but uh, but uh, when we look at it overall if we then um, so that was the general picture. If we look at the specific picture on Denmark, we uh, have identified eight pressures. Um, if you have the report, you, you'll be familiar with them. Uh, otherwise, I urge you to download the report and, uh, and familiarize yourself with them. Uh, what I want to say about them here is actually the next uh, page uh, is when, when you factor these eight pressures uh, into a picture of uh, the main industries in Denmark, and again, uh, apologies for for the busy slide here. Uh, the only thing I want I want you to notice on this slide is that no matter what industry you represent, um, these pressures will uh, will be relevant to you. And just to make two points, uh, if we go to the bottom, that's the finance industry, typically an industry where people will say they don't have a massive uh, footprint when it comes to biodiversity loss, but they have a that's that 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 can be true in some senses, but they have a major role to play, as Bo has already mentioned, uh, looking at city and uh, Swiss Re. Um, how do we how do we uh, assess risk on uh, on companies and investments? How do we how do we uh, uh, estimate value of companies in the future? Um, the finance industry obviously has huge uh, roles to play uh, they are they have come far on climate and we will need them to play uh, a significant and uh, an equally uh, important role on biodiversity loss and then if we uh, just look at the uh, at the very far uh, right of the slide that's uh, built environment uh, no obviously no uh, no industry in denmark will, will will be able to say we don't have any built environment so so those two points, just uh, just as as examples of uh, the argument that no no industry in Denmark, no company in Denmark can say we don't really have a role to play. We all have a role to play. Uh, certainly, uh, the company I represent uh, have a role to play, and I haven't met one single uh, client of mine that uh, does not have a role to play when it comes to to this particular um, topic. When, when that said, I, I, I want to highlight uh, that the reports that WWF and Bain has been working on now for for uh, yeah almost a year have uh, industry deep dives. So so if you haven't got the report, um, again I urge you to to download it either from WWF or uh, or, or via Bain. And uh, there you can familiarize yourself with the sector deep dives. This is a this is an example from the uh, agricultural uh, industry, but uh, but there will be deep dives on uh, on more or less all major range industries. Yes. So when we uh, interviewed and surveyed Danish companies, we we found uh, quite a few uh, interesting uh, uh, facts. Uh, and we've <laughs> we've listed them in a in a logical way here, saying that uh, seventy percent of Danish companies see uh, biodiversity as a medium to large threat. However, fifty percent of them uh, don't really see that they have an impact. Forty percent uh, say that they have some kind of goals. When we look at those goals, they are only tangible in less than 20% of, uh, of the surveyed companies. 
and less than 10% of the companies uh, have an actual biodiversity section in their strategy, be it the sustainability strategy or, or general strategy. So uh, that is not uh, the picture we had hoped for, but, uh, but, but obviously it's better to, uh, to face the facts than, uh, than the opposite. We, we are working, as Bo said, on a conference to come later in the year. We are doing this webinar now. We are talking to uh, to all the uh, interest uh, interested parties uh, at WWF, and certainly with all paying clients about uh, um, the role that uh, that uh, both uh, the major industries, but but obviously also the individual companies in those industries can play to bring these uh, percentages. Uh, uh, to a dramatically different level when we uh, when we survey uh, uh, Danish companies uh, again, which I'm sure we'll do uh, either this year or uh, or early next year. Yes, as Bo has already uh, mentioned, uh, I can't imagine a company uh, where biodiversity loss does not figure on the strategic agenda, on the top of the strategic agenda in, in the years to come. Uh, Ukraine has highlighted it, but uh, but we will see resource scarcity uh, on a number of uh, levels in uh, in the years to come, as Bo was just uh, so persuasively uh, demonstrated. Uh, some of this will be due to to natural uh, natural hazards. We we see them on uh, on our TV screens every day. Uh, we will come back in, in this webinar to, to the regulations that, uh, that are a natural consequence of, uh, of the scarcities and hazards. And uh, companies that fail to, to address this uh, will face severe risk when it comes to the, to the reputation. And I don't have to mention how companies are being exposed on uh, on their Ukraine uh, stands. Uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of companies uh, have worried about greenwashing when they do their sustainability uh, reports, and um, and and this will be uh, one of the major things uh, when it comes to uh, biodiversity loss. What companies can with Authenticity and uh, and credibility say that they have uh, they have addressed this to uh, to to the full extent of what's possible. Companies that do not will face uh, reputational damage. That's uh, beyond doubt. Okay. Last, um, as as uh, already mentioned, I think we uh, we need to highlight that there are significant business opportunities for companies who. Uh, who gets ahead of legislation, ahead of uh, reputational damage, uh, starts um, transforming into nature positive uh, business models. As Bo just mentioned, this is not rocket science, at least uh, in, in many aspects of it. It's, it's uh, actions that are feasible now. It's actions that are, uh, that, that if, we, if we look at it in medium term, are feasible in in uh, financial terms as well. So so uh, not only uh, something to be parked in a, in a risk department or or, or in cost occurred or incurred, but uh, but something to be seen as a, an opportunity to get ahead of legislation, to get ahead of competitors, to get to gain um, a consumer sentiment that uh, that will benefit the company. And with those words, Bob, I think uh, over to the roadblocks that we learned from uh, from the company we spoke to. Yeah, so so thanks. So uh, during the interviews, we also discussed with companies, those who were aware of these uh, challenges, why they did not work uh, with them or were uh, waiting to start up. And there were four major uh, reasons for that. Uh, and I will just run through them uh, rather swiftly, uh, one, one by uh, one. So uh, the first uh, one is that uh, a lot of companies do not feel that uh, biodiversity loss is, is related to them. It's a societal problem. 
And we have this same challenge uh, on, uh, on climate. So back in the day, uh, each company was thinking, but that's a society problem. Why do I have to go, uh, go first? Uh, what we know now is that uh, there is significant uh, opportunities for those who, uh, who go uh, the extra mile and, 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 and are first on these uh, issues. If you look into the sector deep dive, some of them eight, 10 pages long in the, in the technical report, you can actually see examples on how you can save money and you can get inspiration from other companies who have, uh, have gone further on, uh, on, on this. So think of the climate 15, 20 years ago, if your bosses are telling you that this is society's problem, it's, it's not our problem. Then uh, there is um, the supply chain. So as I mentioned before, uh, what the research uh, showed, and you can see in, in depth in the report, um, a lot of companies get pretty surprised once they look into the full exposure of their global uh, supply chains. So you buy a lot of stuff that is related to nature and, and, and often the companies are not aware of this. Uh, so this is a lot about supply chain work. And in a second, uh, Torsten will talk a little bit more about uh, supply chains, uh, because this is where, for most of you, the most important impact is. So even if you're just a company that uh, has, uh, uh, you could say you sell your brains and don't have a lot of uh, production, uh, you still uh, are buying a lot of materials that's somehow related to the, to the natural uh, world. So, so you have to ask tough, tough questions to your supply chains. Um, the, the, the next one is uh, about what, what can I then do if I have this impact? Because if, you, if you're a building company, you use sand, you can stop using uh, sand if you are in the pharmaceutical industry and you have huge tank with, uh, with the production, you, you use sugar, you use um, uh, phosphorus uh, and so on from, from the natural world. And therefore, we, we always say, you need to look into this hierarchy. So try to see, can we avoid this? If not, can we minimize the use of these materials? If that's not possible, can we restore the natural world? So yes, we have an impact, but we also restore uh, what we've been, uh, our impact. So, so we try to level it out. If that's not possible, then you get into a, to a more complicated area. And here we recommend, that you do what we call insetting before you offset. So just like in climate, it's better that you invest in something that really solves the problems and can scale instead of just saying, uh, uh, we will offset this, we will buy credits or certificates. So try to use your money if you want to do offsetting to inset and to invest so you will have economy of scale and, and have an impact uh, beyond your business for the same amount of money. Uh, then uh, a lot of companies are saying we are investing so heavily and also have engaged our company so heavily in the climate crisis or other uh, ESG topics that we simply can't cope with biodiversity on top of this. Uh, and this is important because what the research shows, and there are, as I mentioned, examples in the report that you can be inspired from, probably also from your industry, is that it is, actually, it is actually possible to both solve biodiversity and deforestation and climate and water in integrated uh, projects around the world, hence uh, the insetting. Uh, we don't have an we only have an hour today and I, I could talk about this for hours because some of these, uh, if done right, can be really exciting and also a little complicated, these types of, of, of projects. But I will just give you a, 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 a top of the line highlight. For example, a project like this in Myanmar, it could also be in Africa and elsewhere. So here you have areas where you uh, take out uh, the rainforest, uh, you, uh, you use the wood uh, for, for different kinds of production. Uh, then you have agriculture of rubber or other materials that you are, you're buying. Perhaps some of the wood ends up in the paper you're buying or it gets burned and you get the energy. If you invest in local society, uh, you get something like this. This is a woman electrician who's been educated uh, to, to um, control uh, some um, uh, solar panels. 
you introduce new uh, workplaces, they start producing stuff, and you link the investment that, that, that you're doing to the integrity of nature. So the more they protect nature in that specific area, the more we invest in new jobs and businesses uh, which are sustainable. Uh, and you can do this around the world, and these types of projects are highly effective, way more effective than just traditional nature protection or buying uh, credits. The last uh, and perhaps most important roadblock, the fourth roadblock, is about uh, what are the tools and the standards. So if we work with climate, you have the tools and you have standards. A lot of businesses are now working with the um, uh, SPTI initiative, which, which is a way that you can say, what is exactly my climate impact and how can I uh, deal with it? And it is true that these uh, tools are not available for biodiversity uh, right now. But there are good news. Firstly, uh, within the next half year, seven, eight months, both uh, filter you, uh, uh, or risk filters will be available. So WWF is launching a biodiversity risk filter done with a lot of different other partners, I think 20 partners all in all. Here you can go into a tool and you can actually see if I have a factory here or if I source materials from here, what is the impact on nature? How threatened is this nature? What can I do to solve, uh, to solve the problem? So very soon you will know what's the impact. Furthermore, the science-based targets network, uh, which is um, uh, introduced for climate, will soon launch also uh, a nature target list. So here you will have a complete methodology and standard and framework for working with biodiversity. I must also though say thirdly, don't wait just for these materials. There are, and Torsten will show you in a second, there are lots of other tools and materials, may not standardized, but you can start working with your supply chains right now and get ahead of the start. No reason to wait for these rather complicated uh, uh, materials. Uh, and why is it complicated? Just a brief word on that. If you have climate, you have one universal standard, and that's a CO2 equivalent. If you uh, take out two equivalents in the US and you emit one in, in Europe, you're still making the world one CO2 equivalent uh, better. It's one currency for all of the problem. But it's not like that for biodiversity. So that's a huge difference if your factory is in Africa or in Asia. One place it may be uh, uh, land use, another place it may be water and so on. But this new tool, uh, once uh, it's now uh, being tested with, uh, with companies, also a Danish company, part of the test. Uh, but when it's launched, you can actually see what's my, what, if I have business here, what does it mean on water? What does it mean on, uh, on, uh, on uh, endangered species? What does it mean on, uh, on earth surface, soil integrity, and so on? So um, those were the four roadblocks. We believe there are ways uh, around these work, uh, roadblocks. Uh, they were mentioned almost by all of the companies interviewed. Look into the, the big reports and you can find the examples and, and the good advice on, on how to come around these uh, challenges so you can start the work in your company. So uh, then what should happen in the businesses? Over, over to you, Torsten. Thank you, Bo. Uh, just uh, picking up on your comment on, on complexity, um, I think I've always been a naive person, but uh, I was certainly uh, quite naive when I first spoke to you about uh, exactly the, the way to measure. And um, I remember I had a, I had a notion of, of uh, square meters and, and obviously uh, also for, for for territorial waters and uh, and, uh, and fresh water that you could that you could measure uh, biodiversity loss by square meters and uh, and uh, the equivalent for for water and that's that's that was a very naive notion that I was quickly brought out of and uh, I also think uh, adding to your uh, adding to your argument Bo, that that uh, I, I have worked with. Uh, with CO2 uh, reductions in many companies. And uh, that, that, I think that has been super rewarding and, and also challenging, but, uh, but biodiversity has a, a non-linear or, or, 
og øh, super chaotic øh, uh, cause and effect uh, that, that climate does not to the same extent. So, so uh, the, the availability of tools and standards is super important and uh, that's why it's it's good news that uh, that a lot of uh, tools are coming. Coming back to the Danish uh, companies, for transitions to reduce impact on nature, obviously supply chain, I'm going to come back to that in, uh, in, a, in a moment. Own operations, that's a given. Uh, consumption, uh, this is about awareness. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, no company can say they don't have built environment. So, uh, so uh, a lot of things to think about when, when we look at our, uh, our responsibilities as companies uh, on that as well. But if we if we jump to supply chain, and in the middle of this picture we have direct operations, so so that's a part of this, uh, obviously, uh, as it is in any supply chain. Um, it's no surprise that uh, a consultant like myself will uh, will uh, advise companies to look uh, both upstream and downstream, and um, there are a lot of roles uh, that that companies should play. When they look at themselves in the, their direct operations, as, as I've already said, the built environment, the uh, the processes uh, they they use. Um, when we look upstream, as uh, Bo just said, that there is a huge role for all companies uh, to play. Are we using materials that are a part of the solution or a part of the problem? Unfortunately, as we found in in the interviews, many many companies think they are using uh, raw materials and other input to their uh, operations. They think they are, they are, uh, they're good, they are well thought through, but, uh, but in, in reality, they are a part of the problem. Be it sand, be it uh, soybeans, be it uh, palm oil, be it more or less everything, we need to start scrutinizing not only for for climate effect but for biodiversity effect. And obviously, when we look downstream, we have a we have a role to play as well, um, creating the awareness um, and uh, making sure that companies that have an authentic and uh, credible uh, footprint on uh, nature makes makes uh, end consumers and customers aware that uh, that this is the way to go this is the way to uh, avoid reputational damage and be a part of uh, of the solution the report has quite a few inspirational uh, examples uh, here we uh, we we we've uh, mentioned uh, some uh, danish ones and, uh, and nordic ones and if we go to the next slide, uh, you will see a lot of uh, international ones, examples of uh, companies that have committed to and uh, and are mentioning what is it that we are precisely uh, doing to uh, to be nature positive. So a lot of a lot of inspiration, uh, and and obviously the the main reason for that is to inspire uh, all you people out there and ourselves. Uh, not to wait for uh, for science-based targets or risk filters, even though that we obviously are thrilled that they are coming along. But uh, to get started, get ahead of legislation, get ahead of tools and standards. Uh, it's almost certain that all these companies that you that you see here and all these uh, uh, actions that have been taken will uh, will will make them uh, winners in uh, in the competition of tomorrow. Yeah, I think this 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 uh, this is a list of uh, tools that are already available uh, to companies that want to uh, that want to get started. And if we if we flip to the next slide, we can see a lot of companies that are working with uh, with certification and measurement. Uh, so. so the the last of the the roadblocks that Bo mentioned is simply uh, a bad excuse. Don't be don't be caught uh, using that. There are a number of things you can do. There are a number of uh, measurements that that uh, can help you. There, there's a number of standards and uh, 
and uh, certifications that are trustworthy and um, and that you can impose on yourself, you can impose on your your suppliers, and uh, and create awareness about. So so a lot of things to do. We uh, we end the the report with a lot of tough uh, questions, and um, if I was to highlight what I would expect a board and an executive management team to be to be able to answer, it's obviously. Do we know our footprint? Do we know our exposure? Do we have targets, real targets that can be measured? Um, do we have actions to uh, to to reach those targets? And then, uh, do we know our risks, i.e., legislation and uh, and uh, other uh, other types of risks? And do we know what opportunities um, this situation will uh, create for our industry and more importantly for ourselves if if you can answer those questions i'll be super impressed and i uh, i would like to buy you a cup of coffee so let me let me hear from you um if not i think those are the ones that uh, i would recommend any board that i speak to any management team that i speak to to uh, to make sure that they're that that we're able to to answer in uh, in uh, the shortest possible time frame. With that, thanks, and uh, over to you for the uh, concluding remarks. Yes, yeah, so uh, so thanks a lot. Um, as mentioned, um, uh, for your specific industry, going into the to the to report at, at the very end here, there's also an overview of this in the report. Uh, just a few highlights on what's going to happen in in the in the next. Um, in the next couple of, uh, of years, uh, because the thing here is uh, that these reports, as mentioned earlier, that show that this will have a huge impact on the on the financial sector and on uh, sorry on on our economies and the businesses in the coming years, means that the, a lot of legislation is underway. Uh, there's a complete list in the report. So again, a very busy uh, slide here uh, that shows what uh, legislation is uh, is underway. Um, most important at the center of this is the new European uh, Green Deal. I'm sure most of you have heard about it, but if you look into the underlying legislation and directives and stuff that's coming out of the European uh, Green Deal, you will find that, I, that all industries, more or less in Denmark, uh, will be impacted by, by this uh, legislation uh, coming up. So this is just an example. It's not even a complete list. It's just to show you there will be a new strategy for, for textile. Uh, there will be a renewable energy. Uh, a lot of you buy green energy. Right now, it's OK for green energy to be uh, uh, fire uh, wood. So, so uh, you, can, you can burn wood and it's green energy. That will change in the next couple of years. And you need new energy contracts with your suppliers. There's the legislation on plastic. Uh, there's, a, there's a nature restoration law coming up. Uh, should have been implemented just before the summer holidays. It's postponed because of the UK war. This means that 30% of all nature in Europe uh, must be, um, uh, uh, land area must be nature in the, in the future. Uh, if, if implemented in Denmark, this will mean less uh, production uh, area and so on and so on and so on. So uh, there, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, palm oil in, in diesel probably will be phased out in 2030. Right now they're discussing 2050. This means that if you think you have green fuels, you do not. So it's really worth look into, looking into all of this uh, legislation. The new biodiversity strategy is also underway. I urge you to look into that. Uh, right now, the Danish politicians are discussing what they're going to do uh, about this, uh, but it will also influence almost all Danish uh, companies. All materials that come out of land uh, will probably raise in price because we need more land uh, for, for nature. If you somehow related to the natural water systems in Europe, if you take our water from lakes and so on, these needs to be uh, restored. Dams needs to be removed. It will probably mean less energy from dams and, and so on. 
Uh, and then there's the climate, climate uh, targets. I know a lot of you are experts on climate and done a lot of work. I just want to tell you that, uh, that uh, this too will be influenced if we have more wind farms. These wind farms will probably have to be uh, nature positive uh, in the future. So this means that wind energy is no longer just uh, wind energy. The same goes with wood and wood pellets. So uh, uh, we have a rather huge, I think around 20% of heat and, and electricity in Denmark is, uh, is wood uh, fired. It's probably going to end in the coming years if, if, uh, if the EU have the way. So, so as mentioned a couple of times, a lot of legislation coming up. Then there's the new uh, EU taxonomy. Uh, this is the uh, Italian uh, commissar in the EU for, for that area. His name is Paolo, and this means that uh, from the 1st of, uh, of January, uh, all major companies, and that includes thousands of Danish companies, need to report uh, into the new taxonomy. It has six areas, only two of which are related to climate. I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to talk to the CFOs of 300 Danish companies. They did not know they had to report on, on nature impact. So two of the six climate two of the six related to, to nature, you will have to report on biodiversity next year. So uh, if you don't think you can come through in the top management team with biodiversity, just take power in one hand and the new taxonomy law in the other hand and, uh, and your CFO will uh, wake up and smell the coffee. Then in uh, December, uh, very importantly, there will be a huge uh, international conference. It's the last thing I'm going to mention here. We are running out of time. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a new, uh, you could say, Paris Agreement for Nature, just like the Paris Agreement for, for Climate. Uh, it's not going to be in China. It's been moved to, uh, to Canada, but it will be in December. And, uh, and uh, what you need to know about this conference is that here, uh, probably as it looks right now, uh, all of the governments will come together and they will say that we need to half the footprint, half the footprint of production and consumption on nature in, in, in the future. There will be 30% uh, of land mass uh, will be uh, the nature. You will be forced to use nature-based solutions. I mentioned that you can use, uh, you can plant a forest instead of, of uh, digging for water in some places of the world. Uh, you need to plan for land use when you uh, construct new buildings and so on. So all of this is coming in December, heavy negotiations right now. Uh, probably going to be diluted a little from what I'm telling you right now. And that's why I have this final thing I want to show you, because a lot of major countries have been out saying that they support a lot of these and will support them in Canada. So here you can see the G7, you can see the Global Ocean Alliance, you can see the G20, you can see the Leaders Pledge for Nature, which has also been signed by, uh, by the Danish uh, government. A lot of these restrictions on how you use nature will most probably be implemented. So heavy legislation uh, uh, on the way, which will influence directly uh, your companies. So, uh, so thank you. This was exactly an hour, actually, one minute over an hour. I hope we have a little more time for, for, uh, for, um, uh, for questions. But as, as I mentioned, give us a call and we will also have a conference later in the year. Not so much about these uh, reports, but more how can we work with this? How do all of these uh, things work? Inspiration from companies in Denmark around the world. I know, I know most of you really want those, uh, those inspirational things. What have others done? It's all in, in the report. So I would like to, uh, to thank you on behalf of both uh, Bain and & Company and WWF for attending. Uh, I hope uh, it gave you an idea. Download the report and I, I hope to see you at different conferences, our conference uh, in, with your boards or whatever in the coming months so that the Denmark can get a head start on this and we can get our hands on a lot of those nice money that awaits those who will be sustainable in this area uh, in the future. So thank you everybody for attending and, uh, and have a nice day.